you know, uh, well-known people within a uh, person within the Linux community. And he's going to make a presentation about the uh, recent story of the embed Linux open source related things. Tim Bird, uh, please go ahead. Thank you. I will uh, show you myself here for just a little bit. <laughs> sure. I've got as my background uh, Bryce Canyon, which is a popular tourist area. I went there uh, over the winter uh, and took that picture. Uh, but uh, let me just go ahead and share my slides now for the presentation. Uh, let's see. And I need to start the presentation. OK. Can everybody see that OK? I think maybe you'd better set, set the uh, presentation mode so that the uh, screen size will become wide. Uh, is it? Uh, well, let's see. See the bottom, and uh, there's a uh, there's an icon of the. Uh, I did. I share content. Is there some? Uh, am I not full screen? Unfortunately, not for skinny. That's a, that was the uh, edit mode. All right, let me see. Let me share again. Uh, are you seeing? Uh, That's great. That's great. Okay, great. Okay. Uh, well, thank you everyone for attending today's uh, open source uh, Japan Jamboree. Uh, this is the Embedded Linux Community Update uh, for May of 2021. And uh, I was a little bit worried when I started this presentation because uh, I, I gave my last uh, version of this talk in March, which is only two months ago. And I th thought I would not have enough material, but uh, a lot of interesting stuff has happened in the last, uh, the last couple months. So uh, just by way of introduction, if you've never seen this talk before, the nature of this talk is that it is a quick overview of lots of different embedded topics, uh, springboard for further research. So I don't go in depth in a lot of for a lot of these this material, but uh, hopefully if you see something interesting, uh, you have a link or a term that you can search for uh, on the web and find out more information. There is some overlap with material I've given previously because I cover the whole last year's worth of kernel versions. So I may go over some slides uh, that have older kernel information in them. I may go over those quickly. Uh, so I apologize for that. Uh, but uh, you can look at my previous talks uh, to see kind of more detailed information about the stuff that I, that I go over quickly. And again, uh, the disclaimer here is that this is not comprehensive. Uh, I don't intend to cover every possible topic. Uh, it's just stuff that I saw and did a little bit of research on and hopefully is useful. Uh, so my normal outline, I'll go through the kernel and then some different technology areas. I'll talk about conferences and industry news and then just give some resources. So starting with the Linux kernel, uh, these are the Linux kernel versions for the last year. Uh, notice that we've been oscillating between 63 and 70 days. It's either it's either uh, nine weeks or ten weeks for to get a Linux kernel out, and that's that's pretty standard. Uh, it just depends on kind of how long the merge window is and how long the how how many release candidates we go through. Notice that uh, the five twelve kernel, uh, which came out in April, uh, was seventy days, and that actually is because it got off to kind of a slow start. There was a delay due to power outages uh, in Oregon where uh, Linus Torvalds lives. He was without power at his house for a couple of days uh, due to a winter storm in February. So that one got off to kind of a slow start, but it was just, e even with that, it was still kind of the normal uh, range of 70 days. Uh, this week, we are on uh, Linux version 5.3, release candidate three, which uh, means we've gone through the merge window for about two weeks and we've had three weeks of testing. Uh, it's the current kernel. I would expect the 5.13 kernel to be finalized on either June 27th or July 4th. I'd be surprised if it was not one of those days. Given that July 4th is a holiday in the US, uh, something weird could happen, but I, I kind of doubt it. 
looking back just really quickly at some of the stuff that's been in in these kernels uh so in the 5.8 kernel back in august we had uh, inline encryption for file systems uh, KGDB can now work with the boot console, so you can use uh, the kernel in kernel debugger, which is actually compiled into the kernel uh, while you're booting. Uh, this allows you to debug earlier, which is pretty nice. Uh, there is a new generic kernel event notification system uh, that was added that's hoping to replace some of the other kernel notification systems that are based on networking or uh, a protocol called Netlink. Um, let's see. In uh, Linux version 5.9, some of the features uh, were there was a new debugfs equals command line option uh, that allows you to turn uh, debugfs on or off at boot time, uh, which is pretty nice. So debugfs is very useful for debugging the kernel. It contains a lot of information that's accessible from user space. Uh, but if you don't want to disclose sensitive data, you can turn that off when you boot. Or you can uh, leave it, you can use an option called no mount, no dash mount, and that will leave the debugfs uh, installed and operating in the kernel, but it won't be mountable. So it you won't be able to see it from user space. But if you have a, a debugger, you can still go in and look at the data with, with a debugger. So uh, that's useful in some circumstances. Uh, another, another thing that happened was there was a macro called uninitialized var which was used to kind of quiet some kernel warnings during compilation. Uh, but the kernel developers decided that was a bad idea. It'd be better to see the warnings and have people fix the issues uh, or improve the compiler so it didn't give you false warnings. Uh, in any event, they removed this macro and uh, found, uh, to no one's surprise, uh, that it had been hiding some bugs with actual uninitialized variables. Um, Another thing that happened in this release was that an NRD was deprecated. Uh, so everyone, there's something that everyone in the world calls an NRD, but it, it's really an, NR, an initram FS. So in embedded, you usually have a, a file system that is uh, in RAM, uh, and that's why it's called initram FS, that is kind of a startup file system just used during booting. So it has maybe your loadable modules and maybe some other stuff uh, to deal with the bootloader and load firmware. Uh, but the, the previous version of this was, was actually a block-based device instead of a, um, uh, instead of a, a, a file system or RAM-based device. Anyway, that initRD is, is now deprecated. Um, so anyway, so that's gone. So code, people are actually taking code out of the kernel. And we'll see a couple more examples of that in more recent kernels. Uh, a new set of system calls, uh, or one system call in particular, close range, is a new syscall to close a group of file descriptors. So you can close a whole bunch of them. Uh, this is good in, in server environments um, where potentially thousands of uh, file descriptors need to be closed uh, at the same time. Um, in the 5.10 kernel, uh, this is getting into December. Uh, there was uh, patches for something called static calls that were finally merged. Uh, so static calls are a way to um, have uh, a call at, uh, that is statically compiled into the kernel, but that can be updated at runtime. So this is this is not exactly the same thing as what tracing does, where it goes through and and uh, replaces things, but it's it's pretty similar to that. Uh, it's it, it's very good for tracing. Um, but it's also good for some other things where you want to have really, really fast uh, calls, uh, even though you're doing call indirection. Uh, so most of the times when the kernel is doing call indirection, it does it by jumping through a pointer, uh, which uh, has some overhead involved with it. Uh, this actually puts the address in line in the code itself, and so it's not going through a register load. Uh, and so it's actually a little bit faster. And so there's some, if you're really, really, really tight on performance, uh, you may want to use this uh, for your indirect calls. Uh, another thing in 5.10 is printk has a new lockless ring buffer. So there's been a long-term project to overhaul printk uh, to try and make it so that it works under any circumstances. 
Uh, and there, there used to be a lot of data structures that as as data was inserted into the print K buffers, uh, the buffers were locked or the devices that were used to output the data were locked. Uh, but <clears throat> there's now a ring buffer that's lockless. And uh, so that work of uh, making print K more effective and and safer to use, uh, even if you're like in the middle of a panic or something, uh, that work continues. Uh, the ext4 file system has new fast commits mode, uh, and uh, I think I talk about that a little bit later. Uh, but if I don't, it's uh, <clears throat> I described it last time. It, it's basically a way to uh, uh, to make a recovery of a file system uh, happen faster. Um, and actually to make the commits of the file system faster. So runtime improvements on, on both the uh, regular runtime operation and on recovery operation uh, in ext4. So that was pretty exciting. So in Linux 5.11, getting into February, uh, there was a new system call interception mechanism uh, based on process the process control, uh, PR control uh, system call. Uh, and that is used for emulating Windows system calls, so uh, things like Wine uh, or other other systems that uh, that implement personalities for other operating systems. So not a lot of people run BSD applications on Linux, but uh, theoretically you could do that with uh, with this new system call interception mechanism. So as the so as uh, uh, system calls are made, uh, you can uh, intercept those and actually push them back up to the user space and translate them into uh, into whatever that other operating system needs. Um, there was a new syscall that supports nanose nanoseconds timeouts called ePoll P wait 2. Uh, this is the highest resolution timeouts we've seen on an ePoll call, which is allows you to uh, pull drivers to see if they have new data or to see if the operations need to be performed on them. And you can, this actually helps you uh, meet like real-time deadlines better uh, because your polling can be uh, quite a bit tighter. Of course, you have to be very careful not to overload the system with this. Um, and then uh, the ability, another real-time related uh, feature in 5.11 was the, the ability to disable process mi migration between CPUs. So normally in a multi-CPU system, uh, you want to once you've started a process, you want it to you you want it to stay on, on the same process it was. Uh, but Linux has the ability to uh, see if there are idle processes and and move a process from one um, CPU to another as part of its load balancing. Um, and uh, the problem with that, the, well, that's a good thing normally. That's very good for throughput uh, because you can put a a process on a uh, on a uh, CPU that was idle, but uh, what's bad about that is if you happen, if that process happens to be a real-time process, uh, that can be uh, that can cause delays uh, as the process is moving between CPUs, and so you don't want those delays to interrupt your real-time capabilities. Um, and so this is this is a really nice feature that's been desirable for quite some time. People have been doing this kind of with add-on patches. And in an ad hoc fashion uh, for quite some time, uh, but uh, this allows you to kind of do it at runtime and control it more effectively. Uh, and then Linux 5.12, which was the last actually released kernel, came out in April of 2021, uh, and we have uh, O profile removed. That's another one of these systems uh, that's legacy kind of Unix systems that's been removed. Uh, now that we have uh, the perf system. And perf events uh, that can do everything that O profile used to do. Um, there's another real time related thing called preempt dynamic, which uh, allows selecting the preemption mode at boot or at runtime. So actually at runtime you can control uh, what level of preemption mode you're going to do. There there are several different letter levels from none to uh, to voluntary to full preemption. And uh, they have different performance characteristics and, and real-time characteristics, but and you used to only be able to control that uh, at compile time, uh, but now you can control it actually at either boot time or even during runtime. You can turn turn that preemption on or off. Uh, and then uh, in Linux 5.12, we've got a power management 
feature, uh, dynamic thermal power management. And this allows uh, power usages of groups of devices uh, to be managed and capped to meet thermal constraints. So you can take a you can take a collection of devices and say uh, if uh, any of these are if this group of devices is 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 starting to exceed uh, some power threshold or some uh, heat threshold, then you can uh, throttle them back uh, through a bunch of different mechanisms, either uh, frequency uh, voltage scaling or, or frequency scaling or something like that. Uh, so that's actually pretty nice. We've seen we've seen all kinds of stuff for power management, uh, but we haven't seen thermal power management. So having it be related to thermal constraints is is the thing that's new here. So actually tied to how hot portions of the CPU are getting, you can turn off devices or clock them down or something. And then this is actually something I missed when I gave my presentation last time. This had, this made the merge window, but I somehow I, I missed it when I gave my presentation in March. So Nintendo 64 support has been added to the Linux kernel. Uh, so Nintendo 64 is a very old video game console, uh, and it's a MIPS, uh, I think it's a MIPS architecture. Uh, so I'm not sure who wants to do this, who wants to run Ninten uh, Linux on their Nintendo 64. Uh, the, the console, I believe, most consoles had either four or if you expanded them to eight meg of RAM. So I'm, once you get Linux on there, I'm not sure how much memory you have left over to do anything kind of useful with the console. And it's really it's kind of interesting to see support for a really, really old device go into the kernel at the same time uh, people are taking out uh, other other things that have gone unused. So I don't know. People speculate that maybe this will only last a couple of uh, revisions. But the general rule in Linux is if there is a maintainer uh, for something, if someone's willing to maintain it, uh, it can stay around. If people are interested in it, even if it's a hobby project or old, there are old PowerPC ports still in the kernel that are maintained by people. So uh, I just thought that was pretty interesting. Uh, other things in 5.12 uh, were that the build system can use Clang's uh, link time optimization features on ARM 64 and x86 architectures. I'm going to actually come back and talk about LTO, link time optimization, a bit later because that is important for one of the other features that came in 5.13. So you can kind of see that uh, there's a progression of, of support for things. Uh, first you get support for LTO and then you get some stuff that, that utilizes that in the next version of the kernel. Uh, you have the KFence memory debugging tool, uh, support for that has been added. So you can now uh, debug memory with some in-kernel uh, tools and features. Uh, there's some no, new perf events. So if you're a user of perf, uh, then you, which is the performance tool for measuring tracing and doing things in the kernel, measuring how long things take. You can now report on individual instruction latency, see how long instructions it take to execute. Um, and there's actually a, now a daemon mode uh, that you can use for long running sessions. So you can have perf running for quite a long time and collecting information in the background. And then uh, kind of uh, on a company specific note, uh, there's support for the PlayStation DualSense game controllers. So yay, Sony got some uh, code into the into the kernel. These are the actually the PS4 uh, controllers, but uh, still that's pretty cool. Um, Let's see, uh, Linux 5.13, and I have, uh, many of these are gonna be explained later, so I'm just gonna kind of mention them really quickly. So we've had the merge window for 5.13. So theoretically, if a huge bug was, but, the, but this is not a released kernel, it's in a release candidate phase right now. So theoretically, if there was a bug in one of these, it can get ripped out, but it's, it's extremely unlikely. These have been in the Linux next tree, they've been tested. Uh, within integration with and and these were accepted into the merge window. So most of the time the merge window just shapes out shakes out, you know, kind of minor bugs. Well, integration bugs and stuff that usually whole features don't get removed uh, during the release candidate phase. So in the Linux 5.13 kernel, which should be released in sometime in July, uh, end of June or July, we have support for control flow integrity. And that is a security feature, and I'm going to explain that when I get to talk about security stuff. Uh, the software interrupt processing, processing code from the preempt RT, RT preempt real-time uh, patch set was mainlined. So this is another piece of that patch set, 
and I'm going to talk about that later too. Uh, there's another, there's a log buck, log buff lock that was used uh, by printk that has been removed. So part of removing locking on those log buffers. So uh, first they stopped using it and now they've actually removed the lock completely. Um, there's a support for a generic USB display driver. So this is a different way to push video and graphics out of the system instead of going through a normal GPU driver going out the USB. Um, and I'll talk about that later. Uh, BPF programs uh, can now call some kernel functions directly. So BPF continues to be developed, or eBPF actually, extended BPF, Berkeley Packet Filter. These are, this is um, a virtual machine code that you can execute, that you can compile and load into the kernel, have the kernel run in a virtual machine inside uh, the kernel. And so because that's a dangerous operation, these, these programs are very heavily uh, managed. They run in a kind of a secure, contain, constrained environment inside the kernel. Uh, the ability, so a lot of work went into uh, making it possible for these programs to call kernel functions directly. There were ways to kind of indirectly uh, access kernel services, uh, but uh, now for some special functions, they have to be whitelisted uh, ahead of time at compilation time. Uh, now it's possible for the BPF programs to call those directly. So that actually re results in a performance improvement. Uh, dev slash slash dev slash kmem was removed. So this is a legacy feature and I'm gonna talk about that later. Uh, and then we added a new networking framework. Uh, it's fairly rare to add a brand new networking framework, but there's something called WAN, which was added this release and also a security module. It's also pretty rare to add a, a new security module to the kernel. And there's something called Landlock that uh, has been added. And uh, again, I'll talk about that also later. So uh, there's one set of patches that I think was interesting, raised a lot of discussion on the mailing list that did not make it into this release. It was uh, submitted uh, to the maintainer, the KVM maintainer, and that was uh, virtual machine support, KVM support for the RISC-V architecture. And uh, the reason I bring, there's lots of patches that don't make it into a kernel in a particular release, but this one was kind of interesting. Um, <clears throat> so what happened was the developer contributed some patches and he had, he had been working on these patches, I think for over a year and adding KVM support for risk five. Uh, but it was weird because he added the support to the staging directory. And uh, Greg Crow Hartman, who was in charge of the staging directory said, hey, what's going on here? Uh, shouldn't these go? just directly into the KVM subsystem. And uh, it turned out that the RISC-V maintainer uh, was unwilling to take the patches uh, because the features that were used for this, the particular instructions, uh, were not frozen in the spec for RISC-V. So apparently how RISC-V works is it's uh, people can take the, the CPU and they can uh, lobby to have new instructions Added. Of course, they can add the instructions in their own hardware, uh, but if you want kind of industry agreement on them, you have to get them into a specification. Uh, in this case, the H specification, which stands for hypervisor. So the hypervisor extension specification, uh, that has been floating around the RISC-V ecosystem for uh, over a year, I guess for quite some time. But some vendors got impatient and were already shipping the instructions in their hardware. And uh, I guess this is the price you pay for a mutable hard hardware architecture uh, that people can customize. This is one of the problems that cropped up with MIPS and sometimes even ARM, but ARM, well, anyway, it had less of this issue. But anyway, so people, so there's hardware out in the field that has these uh, hypervisor uh, instructions. And uh, Greg KH said, well, I don't care what the spec says. If there's shipping hardware, uh, the kernel should support it. It's like, it's kind of, you, you guys in the risk community, you got to figure out your spec thing. But if people have already shipped stuff, we can't say, oh, well, we're not going to support it. Um, it's like that's kind of a political war we don't want to get into. Uh, so Greg initially said, I'm not going to take this in staging. That's the wrong way to do it. But he said, if, if that's how, the way it has to go, I may, I may do it. So right now they're still deciding the set of patches was not put into mainline. Uh, they may talk about having the maintainer change the acceptance policy. There actually is a document in the kernel that, that, that says uh, 
uh, risk five will not take code into the main kernel unless it's it for a, an approved spec. And so, and they don't want to break that for a lot of reasons. They don't want a bunch of weird variants running around. Um, but anyway, so this is that was kind of interesting, and uh, that's worth reading up on. Uh, uh, in terms of developer stats, just a couple of really quick notes here. Uh, interesting things. <clears throat> so the most active kernel developers in 5.12. So we don't have the stats for 5.13 yet because it's brand new. But uh, for 5.12, which was the last kernel release, a guy by the name of Lee Jones had the most change sets. He did 256 change sets, or 2% of all the change sets. Uh, and then uh, some other people, various things. And then Christoph Helwig, he's always at the top of the list. He, he, the guy is a machine at churning out code. Now, I thought it was interesting because Lee, this is the first time I've ever seen this. Lee Jones was uh, the most active developer by change sets for 5.12. And he was also the most active change set contributor for 5.11. So he did it two releases in a row, which is pretty rare. And uh, the thing he's been working on Sometimes people get to be most active developer by landing these huge drivers, you know, GPU drivers from AMD that are 50,000 lines long or something. Uh, but Lee has been doing this by uh, working on uh, fixing compiler and docs uh, build warnings. So there's a whole bunch of a whole bunch of code that um, that emits warnings, and it's really nice to get these warnings eliminated. And so a lot of his patches are very small. And so in terms of the number of lines of code, he didn't have a huge number of lines of code, but he had a lot of patches. I mean, over a period of basically two months, he did 256 patches. That's a lot of patches. And there's thousands of warnings, so he still has a lot of a lot more data to go. But this is this is really nice. I think this is a really great service for the um, for the kernel and the community to get these warnings cleaned up. So uh, really happy to see that. In terms of uh, by lines of code, Turns out that Arn Bergman. So now I went into the had 9.4 percent of all the lines changed in this re, in that release. I went to go see if I could figure out what it was, and I looked at I looked at Arn's patches, and I couldn't see uh, anything special. I didn't see any like huge driver. Arn is also one of those developers who just does a whole lot of work. Uh, to have 65,000 lines of changes in one release, that's like over a, over a two-month period. I, some of this stuff has to have been the stuff that he had queued up because I, don't, I just don't see anyone developing code that fast. Uh, but uh, anyway, that's very, very impressive. Almost going up to 10% of a single release by a single guy, uh, that, is, that is very impressive. Single developer. Uh, then another kind of interesting data point for 5.12 was the most active credited uh, reports of bugs fixed. So we're now trying to start to, to keep track of who's reporting bugs, uh, kind of give uh, systems or people credit for bug reports, uh, especially bug reports that get fixed. Uh, and so not every bug that gets fixed get, uh, gets a, a credit line added to it, but uh, for the ones that did, um, notice that uh, four of these five are for robots. So the bug reports are being found and reported by automated testing systems, which is exactly what you want. You, you want developers to spend less time, you know, hunting this stuff down and have automated systems doing it. So um, there's kind of a long tail on this, of course, but the kernel test robot had the highest one with 16, 184 bugs, which was 16% uh, of the bugs that were credited. Um, and, and then if you add them all up, the robots are, are doing something on the order of 40 to 50% of the bug reporting, or at least getting the credited bug reporting. So that's actually a really good sign of, of uh, community help. Oh, okay, so now, this is the last thing I want to talk about the kernel, but this is going to take a while because this was big news. So uh, uh, I, in fact, well, so I'll just give the introduction. If you haven't heard of this, this, I mean, this was super big news within the community, but the University of Minnesota was banned from contributing to the Linux kernel by Greg Crow Hartman, uh, who's one of the leaders. So uh, I'll give you the really quick summary. And then I actually have a presentation that I got from the Linux Foundation. Uh, that I, I just embedded the whole thing because I, I could have kind of summarized it, but I thought it was it was pretty well written. So anyway, 
So the University of Minnesota, uh, some uh, a professor and some grad students had conducted a study to see if it was possible to get patches containing security vulnerabilities into the Linux kernel uh, and published a research paper on the on their findings. OK, so uh, that already starts to uh, raise some uh, alarm flags or some red flags or some alarm bells or uh, they claimed in their paper that no security flaws were intentionally introduced into the kernel as part of their efforts, but they did. Uh, there were some problems with their methodology. The kernel developers were not very happen, happy. So the kernel developers, when they found out about this, actually it's, it's a long story how it got, all got through, but I'll talk about that in the next slides. So they went through and started a complete re-review of all of the patches that University of Minnesota had ever submitted to the kernel at least going back for the last four years, I think. Uh, so let me let me go through the the um, presentation from the Linux Foundation. This is by Craig Crow Hartman and David Wheeler. Uh, the Linux Foundation released this presentation. It's like how not to do research on an open source community. So just uh, just going back and so there's a timeline here. So in August, uh, the University of Minnesota researchers sent some patches that they called hypocrite commits. Uh, hypocrites because they were supposed to be fixing bugs, but they're actually introducing bugs. Uh, and uh, they attempted to introduce vulnerabilities to see if they would be detected uh, by the review process. Uh, some of the problems were that they sent these to kernel developers from false identities. So they lied about who they came from or they created fake accounts. Uh, they did this without the consent of anyone without notice to anyone or any kind of ethics review. So in November, they actually published their paper or they published a paper draft and someone noticed this. Uh, so, uh, uh, someone named Sarah Jamie Lewis said, hey, what's going on here? This doesn't look uh, like good ethics. And so Lewis, uh, Sarah Lewis and others sent a letter to uh, uh, IEEE S&P. I can't, that's a conference or a uh, it's either a conference or a mag I think it's a conference uh, that was going to let this paper be published. And she said, hey, there's something wrong with this. So sometime in December, uh, the University of Minnesota uh, notified their IRB. I'm trying to remember what IRB is. Uh, something uh, review board. Uh, it's an ethics review board. I can't remember what the I stands for, though. Uh, and the IRB said, the University of Minnesota has an IRB, so anytime you're conducting uh, research, especially if it involves humans, you have to have like an ethics review. And uh, they they appeared to give an after the fact exemption to the research, saying, "Well, this is not human research. This was this was technology research." And so the University of uh, Minnesota issued a clarification, uh, and uh, and then things kind of died down for a little while. But then in April. Uh, just this last April, uh, a bunch of patches showed up from University of Minnesota and after seven months of silence. And the, the patches were kind of low quality and people were like kind of on edge because now the word had gotten out that uh, University of Minnesota had written this paper and tried to contribute stuff. So Greg Crow Hartman said, hey, uh, let, don't I, I don't know what's going on with these patches. I don't know if you're if these are real patches or they're bad or part of new research. The researchers claimed immediately that the new patches were not part of the of the you know malicious commits thing. Uh, but anyway, Greg implemented a ban and said, OK, from now on, no submissions will be accepted from the University of Minnesota, from umn.edu until this all gets figured out. So then all kinds of crazy stuff started happening. So uh, things happened really fast. So uh, Greg Crowhart uh, actually issued a recommendation to revert all of the code. The TAB, which is the Technical Advisory Board of the Linux Foundation, started reviewing uh, the situation. And uh, Greg sent a letter, a letter to the university asking for a bunch of information. I'm not going to read through all of that, but um, uh, he wants a bunch of bunch of requests that we can figure out so we can figure out what's going on and uh, uh, kind of stipulated some requirements. So on the 24th, uh, university issued an open letter to the Linux community kind of apologizing and they retracted their paper uh, and uh, actually 
uh, by April 27th, University of Minnesota. So this happened pretty quickly. I got to at least give them credit here. A lot of people said they made some big mistakes here, uh, but they did try to um, try to address the issues raised. Well, at this time they were banned, so maybe they felt a sense of urgency. Uh, but they published a big paper with all kinds of details on the commits and issued a reply. Um, and uh, the university agreed that they would do some additional ethics training um, to prevent something like this from happening in the future. OK, so then uh, Greg Crowhartman uh, posted a final set of uh, reverts, which is uh, take, uh, things patches that take the, the, the original commits out of the kernel uh, and also correct, uh, put some fixes. And then by the fifth, the tab, the technical advisory board had published a very detailed report going in incredible detail about every single patch that U of MN had committed and what the status of it was. So there were 435 total commits. Uh, there were 85 Linux kernel developers uh, that worked on it to figure out what was going on. Uh, and they confirmed that all of the, uh, well, all, all of the intentionally vulnerable patches, so the ones that were part of the hypocrite commit uh, research paper, all of those had been rejected. So <laughs> the interesting thing was there were five patches that uh, University of Minnesota sent. All of them were supposed to contain vulnerabilities, and they were all supposed to uh, see if they could get accepted. And then their their methodology was they were going to try and prevent them from actually making it into the into the Linux code base because they didn't want to actually introduce vulnerabilities. They just wanted to see what, if the review process would catch them. But one pro one patch actually made it all the way into the kernel, and uh, it turned out that the University of Minnesota developers. Uh, did not understand the code appropriately, and instead of submitting a, uh, a code a vulnerable, uh, uh, instead of submitting a bug, a vulnerability bug, which is what they intended to do, they actually submitted a bug fix, and so it was correct. Uh, so the patch that was intended to be vulnerable ended up uh, being a correct fix, and it was actually accepted into the kernel. Uh, however, that patch. Even so, has has still been removed uh, because it was submitted under a false name, uh, and that's against uh, kernel contributor policy. Uh, so most of the patches submitted by the university were found to be correct. However, the overall patch quality was relatively bad, uh, relatively poor. Uh, there were 25 patches that had bugs that were later fixed. And then 39 still outstanding. So the overall, uh, outside of this research project, uh, the out of those 435 University of Minnesota patches, they introduced a total, uh, oh, I don't know, something over 50, 60, 60 bugs. Uh, so they were not high quality patches. Finally, uh, on May 6th, the university met with Greg uh, Keys, which is another Linux developer, and the Linux Foundation to kind of figure out how to move forward. The IEEE, who had accepted the paper, now said that they were they were sorry about that and that they would put new practices in place to prevent them from accepting a paper with uh, ethical problems like this one. And then the University of Minnesota responded, apologizing again, uh, identifying, agreeing with the TAB report, and. Uh, and also clarifying that this was only this was only done on the Linux kernel. So what happened was a whole bunch of other projects got worried uh, that maybe they had been attacked or or subjected to this research. So some of the some of the issues that came during this process were um, or some some of the issues that this research did was uh, was there were patches that were submitted using fake identities. So there was an intent to deceive the community. Uh, there were Patches submitted with known verse vulnerabilities. So it's one thing if you make a mistake uh, and you kind of innocently submit a, a code that has a bug, but it's quite a different thing if you intend to submit code with a bug. Uh, another big issue uh, was conducting research on a community uh, which consists of humans without notice or consent. So usually when people do like psychological research or social science research, 
Uh, you have to get the consent of participants. You have to have them sign a waiver. Or you have to somehow reimburse them. Uh, none of that happened. Uh, and there was no notice or consent with any of the project leaders. Uh, so if you're doing penetration testing, which is another kind of security thing, often uh, the employees of a company may not know that it's going on, but the the you know the leaders of the company do, and they approve everything before it happens. And none of that happened. So uh, the other the other some of the other issues were every every other well not every other but a lot of other communities scrambled to identify patches to see if U of M N University of Minnesota had uh, had uh, contributed vulnerabilities to other other projects. Um, and then the other issue is there were just there were poor uh, poor contributions in general. So uh, the Linux Foundation has asked the University of Minnesota to designate a set of experienced developers to review and provide feedback. Uh, and this is the same uh, this is the same thing that happens at companies is usually you have some experts that help uh, relatively new contributors review their code before it goes upstream. So. Out of all of this, there's good news and there's bad news. Uh, so uh, the bad news is it's unclear that other communities uh, that have kind of lesser review practices would have caught these issues. So the Linux kernel community actually caught all of the issues, despite what was said in the paper. The paper said that some of the issues were not caught, but they actually were caught and the patches were rejected. Uh, research created a massive amount of extra work for the developer community as we went back and re-reviewed stuff. Uh, and it was, we still don't know why the IRB at Minnesota, the University of Minnesota, decided that this was not a human subjects research. So uh, it's, there seems to be a problem there. So the University of Minnesota said that this was a mistake, still, still says it's not research on human subjects, uh, but but the project was not about the technicality of the code. It was whether or not reviewers would be fooled. And so there's definitely humans involved in that. And uh, so there's a lot of uh, people who have argued that this was indeed human subject research. And there was a whole bunch of guidelines that were not followed. Uh, the NSF, which is the National Science Foundation, which funds a, a lot of this research work in the US, uh, has been notified and uh, hopefully will be able to prevent this in the future. So other bad news, uh, researchers uh, a lot of times do not interact with uh, production development environments appropriately. Uh, the problem is that researchers have a set of goals that are different from the goals for like the Linux kernel developers. And so their, their goal is to find out, you know, information that helps their science and their research. Uh, the kernel developers are uh, more interested in preserving the, uh, the purity or the effectiveness of the code. So actually, the tab is now in the process of working on a guidance document. Um, and these issues apply far more broadly than just uh, University of Minnesota, or even just the US, or just the Linux kernel project. Uh, so uh, there's a lot of questions like, how do, we, how do we make sure this doesn't happen again? Uh, how do we make sure that it, this is not just a one-off uh, problem that we solve, but that we uh, make sure that we include the OSS community uh, in discussions about ethics and research. So the good news is, so that was the bad news. The good news is that the kernel code review process worked. All of the intentional buggy patches were caught. Um, and the one patch that was supposed to be bad uh, was accepted because it was unintentionally correct. And that's an interesting phrase, unintentionally correct. Um, so the Linux kernel developers did rapidly re-review all the contribution. Uh, so hopefully that double check of the code should increase confidence. Uh, although it's still distressing uh, personally that uh, over 60 bugs got into the kernel uh, over the course of several years. Uh, so there was strong public support for Linux kernels developers response. Uh, and uh, there's other research who's who've been working with the kernel community for decades. A lot of people like to do research on the Linux kernel because it's the biggest and possibly the most important uh, open source project in the world. And so there's a lot of opportunity to, to study interesting phenomena there. And other research were very, researchers were very supportive of how the Linux kernel uh, developers handled this. UMN did uh, apologize 
and are actively working to prevent a recurrence. So that's good. They didn't just dig in their heels and say, no, we didn't do anything wrong. Um, and the another thing that's really interesting is uh, this is this has shown other people that you better be careful submitting code to the kernel, that we do have strong review processes. We have rules about intent being deceitful with your email accounts. Um, and uh, we sh it did show that the kernel community will take a harsh measure, like actually introducing a ban uh, if you do the wrong thing. So uh, the Linux Foundation, the University of Minnesota had very productive discussions uh, and they had a call with deans and leadership at the university. Uh, the Technical Advisory Board is uh, identifying someone who can help you of a Minnesota uh, review their patches. Uh, also, the University of Minnesota is reviewing and revising their research policies, uh, and uh, they promised to give the Linux Foundation uh, notification about that. And then uh, the Technical Advisory Board, which includes Greg Carhartman, uh, are working with a bunch of research institutions uh, to publish a best practices document uh, for the community. So all that is actually good. So sometimes uh, out of a kind of a bad situation, a lot of good can come. So that's actually good. So these are the last two of these are kind of the boilerplate slides for the Linux Foundation talk. So what can we expect moving forward? Well, we can expect that the University of Minnesota will add an experienced kernel developer to their staff to pre-review commits. And we can expect uh, the tab to produce a report on best practices uh, for academia and researchers to collaborate with OSS community. So I think we should see some good stuff moving forward. And uh, so I think I think that's good. So here's uh, here's the resources for this. There, it was really interesting to watch this unfold. It unfolded over just a period of a couple of weeks. People moved very, very quickly. I, I can't believe how fast the Technical Advisory Board uh, did their review. Of course, they got 85 developers to help them. Uh, but, you know, so it's a shame that they had to waste a bunch of time to re-review those patches when most of them were good. But at the same time, it, it shows that the kernel was very quick uh, to respond to this, uh, to this problem. Okay, so I, I spent a really long time on that. I apologize, but that was one of the most interesting things that happened in the last two months. So I'm going to go a little bit quicker over some of the other areas, like the technology areas, which are coming up next. So here's the set of uh, technology areas that we're going to talk about. So first, in audio, there's a new thing called the Pipewire daemon. So if, uh, in, and this is really kind of a desktop Linux thing, but these things have a way of uh, working their way into embedded. So Pulse Audio is the current daemon that manages desktop Linux audio mixing and routing. But uh, uh, a couple of years ago, actually, long time ago, five years ago, uh, people started seeing some problems with it. And the way Linux uh, was, especially was using containers, they needed to switch to different systems. So there's now a new daemon called Pipewire uh, that intends to replace Pulse Audio. And this, uh, there's a bunch of differences. I'm not going to get into all of them, but it uses time-based audio scheduling rather than sound card interrupts. Uh, it's very tightly uh, integrated with Linux, uh, so it's hard to run on BSD and other things, but it, it, it's kind of a modern, uses Linux modern APIs for a lot of stuff. And the interesting news here is that Fedora 34, which is uh, Red Hat's uh, kind of bleeding edge uh, community distribution, they're actually going to replace Pulse Audio with Pipewire. So other di distributions have included the package, like Debian, Ubuntu, uh, and ha have included the package, but have not made it the default choice. So actually, Fedora is going to go ahead and make it the default choice for managing audio. And so we'll see how that goes. Hopefully, there won't be a lot of, uh, a lot of issues. Or if they find issues, they'll be able to fix them quickly. So that's kind of a big change in the auto thing. So uh, the core kernel. So in version 5.13 of the kernel, dev kmem was finally removed. Uh, so this, uh, uh, I don't need to go over a whole bunch of this. You can kind of read through it. But this was the predecessor to slash proc and slash sys. The way you controlled stuff inside the kernel and the way you read out stuff like uh, process status and things was to actually open this uh, dev file and read the kernel memory directly. And you had to know like where the structures were in the kernel memory this is a massive security problem uh, and people have moved off it for a long time as soon as they created the whole reason they created slash proc 
was so they would not have uh, PS and other utilities reading this kernel memory directly. Uh, this has been disabled by most distributions for a long time, and it was finally removed uh, completely. So uh, on a personal note, uh, I, I have kind of a, uh, I, I got onto Stack Overflow a couple of years ago and explained something about sys the relationship between SysFS and DevKMem. And uh, of all of my answers on Stack Overflow, I don't have a ton, but of all of my answers on Stack Overflow, that was the one that has given me the biggest reputation score. And I, my reputation score is not humongous. People have tens of thousands. Mine, mine is like a thousand or something. But uh, so that's that answer has has gotten me the most interest. And in. now Dave Dev came in is gone. Came in is gone. So rest in peace. Uh, in terms of development, uh, there are a bunch of new tools being used for upstream kernel work especially something called B4. And I actually talked about this uh, last time quite a bit, so I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to kind of move on. But if you're interested in, in the new tools that maintainers are using, uh, be sure to check out this uh, talk. Uh, the slides are online, and uh, I believe the video is online for this as well. Um, it was given at ELC Europe 2020. In terms of file systems, uh, F2FS has some new compression options that came about in uh, 5.12. IOU ring is the new async um, async mechanism for user space to request the kernel to uh, perform uh, operations. Um, and so now it's got a bunch of new features uh, that are good. I'm going to keep going kind of fast. And then ext4 fast commits. I also talked about this one quite a bit last time. So I don't need to repeat this, but uh, there's there's now kind of two different journals, uh, one for regular file level journals, uh, or, or there's block level journal and a, and a file level journal. And uh, there's a bunch of big performance improvement in ext4. So if you're using an old kernel uh, prior to 5.10 uh, and you're using an ext4 file sim, which almost all Linux desktops are, uh, this is a good one to look into. Um, uh, in terms of graphics, uh, something I thought that was interesting is most of the time in this section I talk about uh, GPU drivers. So like for the different uh, GPU chips and in, in embedded and in, in, in desktop Linux. Uh, but this is this is a little bit different thing. So this is a Am I can people still hear me? Hello. Yes, we can hear you. It's OK. It's recovering. Okay. I lost. I have a picture of someone. I lost my uh, I lost my sharing. So something has gone wrong with my sharing. Just a sec. OK. I have to stop and restart, I think. Okay, are my slides back up? Yeah, it's yes. right back. Okay, okay. So uh, this allows you to send graphics and video over USB. Uh, so this is kind of a different output mechanism for your uh, for your video stream and and for your graphics. Uh, the the reason that people wanted to do this, there's actually a protocol for this, the USB display protocol. Uh, but you can do something like take a uh, Raspberry Pi Zero and turn it into a USB to HDMI adapter. So you can output uh, something from uh, Linux desktop, or I don't know if Windows supports this protocol or not, but you can output over like USB-C uh, and then you know feed it to a TV set or some other display device. So I thought that was pretty interesting. Um, let's see. No. There we go. Okay, then in terms of languages, oh, okay, this this is this is uh, going to blow your mind. So people are actually getting serious about putting Rust in their Linux kernel. So right now, the language of choice for Linux de development is, of course, C, and there's a bunch of stuff in assembly. Uh, but people are serious, uh, and people are actually working uh, to support the Rust language for kernel driver development. Uh, they've been talking about it for a while. I know the first time I heard about it was last August at Plumbers, uh, but they now posted an RFC a request for comments to the kernel mailing list. So the big advantage of Rust, at least what they claim, 
is it has memory safety features. So everybody knows that memory safety is a big issue. There's all kinds of issues with stray pointers and null pointers and and use after free problems in the Linux kernel. And theoretically, Rust could eliminate a lot of those problems. Uh, but the reaction of the kernel developers is very, very mixed. Uh, some people think this would be great uh, to cure a lot of security problems and, and uh, avoid a lot of bugs. Uh, others uh, uh, are really don't want to require kernel developers to know more languages. You already have to be very, very proficient in C to kind of understand what's going on in the kernel. There's a lot, well, C and C, C, pro, C preprocessors. Uh, there's a lot, it's very, very complicated usage of C in the kernel. And if you add Rust into that, it's like, well, that creates a huge barrier for kernel developers, especially if your average maintainer needs to learn of this. Um, so people are not sure uh, e, the, the benefit is worth the cost. Right now, most maintainers seem to have kind of a wait and see attitude. Um, the status is right now, they're not talking about using Rust for any core kernel code, just specific device drivers. Uh, and it's going to take years. Uh, I've seen this type of thing before. Uh, even you know, even things that are self-contained, uh, you know, like a driver for some piece of hardware, can take years to get into the into the uh, kernel. And for for something like this, where it's a whole it's a whole framework and an infrastructure, uh, anyway, it's going to take a long time. But Linus Torvalds wrote uh, on one of his messages in the thread. On the whole, I don't hate it. <laughs> so that's about as good a response uh, from Linus as uh, as you could expect. So what people really want uh, to see is they want to see a bunch of examples where the Rust code actually provides benefits and is not harder to maintain. Um, and that's actually a very, very tall order. So people want to see a real driver converted over to this, and they want to see what the what it looks like, whether you know what the performance is, what the maintenance looks like and if the rust code is you know going to be just too hard to read for existing developers or not uh, but if it provides benefits and and if it if it looks good we may we may see another language support supported by the linux kernel but we'll see uh, another uh thing that caught my eye is python uh in terms of python there's a project called pyodide and I, I don't know where the name comes from. It's, it's explained in, in some of these articles, but basically it allows you to run Python applications in a web browser. Now you could kind of do this. There were some projects to do this uh, a long time ago, uh, uh, but, but this is actual integration into the browser, uh, specifically of the Python data science stack. So there's a whole bunch of libraries that do uh, data science. So. Uh, people who do data science and, and uh, kind of big data uh, visualization and analysis in Python, they're a lot of that is done in Python with something called NumPy and a bunch of other, there's a bunch of other uh, libraries and modules. But uh, people said, well, we would like to do this actually in, in the browser instead of doing it on a backend server or on our local machine, we ought to be able to do it in a browser and that'll make it portable to any platform. So there was a project started in 2019 to do this, and, and it's a very um, ambitious project. Uh, so they actually take C Python, which is the Python language that's written in C, and uh, various of the data science libraries, and they compile that, but they compile it instead of down to native code, they compile it to WebAssembly. Uh, which is a virtual machine architecture that now runs in browsers. Uh, so this is a big project. Uh, I it'll be interesting to see if it takes off. I mean, they seem to be pretty happy with where it's at, but there's still some issues. They have to integrate it with. There's there's a lot of integration required between JavaScript and Python. Uh, you have to have give Python access to the document object model. There's a, a whole bunch of details there. Um, so I I have been using Python, gosh, for well over 30 years now, and so I would be very very happy to see Python be one of the main languages supported on the web uh, because uh, it would be good for me personally. Maybe Python can make a comeback in the browser. Uh, Python is doing very, very well as a, as a native language. Well, native runs in a virtual machine, but as a, you know, a local language uh, to, to have it, you know, be supported in browsers, which are on, you know, everywhere that would, that would really be kind of neat. Okay. So that was just a little sidetrack on languages. Um, 
So something happened again. I lost my screen. So Shunsuki Yoshida has, I'm seeing him on my screen. Hi, Shinsuke. <laughs> but I lost my sharing, so I'm not sure what's going on here. Let me, I'm going to have to do it again. Okay, here we go. Okay, sorry, I'm back. Did, by the way, did my slides uh, drop out anywhere in there? Because they dropped out for me, so I it seemed like I'm losing presentation mode. Anyway, um, okay, so in terms of networking, oh, I gotta, I gotta speed up here. So there's a new uh, wireless WAN framework that was added to kernel in 5.13. This is for cellular network modems. Um, and so you, if you're interested in that, you can, you can look at that. Uh, WiMAX code was removed. This is an old protocol, 802.16. It never took off. It was from 2008. Uh, so that, that networking code is actually removed from the kernel. That's a fairly rare operation. So uh, real-time support in terms of technologies. So a couple of things, disable process migration. I talked about that already. Uh, Preamp dynamic, I talked about that already. Uh, but the one I want to kind of talk about here is uh, the status of preempt RT. So software interrupt processing code uh, was added from the preempt RT patch set. It was mainlined in 5.13. So yet another of the little pieces of preempt RT has been added to the kernel. It is now up in mainline. So uh, so what's left? So it's, it turns out, so it's been going down over the years. It used to be well over 100,000 lines of code. Now it's about 10,000 lines of code in the preempt RT patch. Uh, that's in about 199 patches. So some of the things that are left are some more fixes to the locking code. Uh, there are some big changes to printk. Printk turns out to have kind of some problems uh, with real-time, interfering with real-time performance. Uh, and then changes to the slub memory allocator. Those are kind of the three big areas that I could see. It would be so nice uh, that people are very, very anxious to be able to run Linux RT real time without having to apply a patch. Right now, uh, most like it, distributions have two kernel versions. They usually have a, a regular Linux and a Linux RT version uh, because there's this patch set that you got to apply in order to get the real time features. Uh, so we'll keep whittling it down and hopefully in the next uh, year or two <laughs> well we'll see uh that that'll we won't need a patch anymore to get that um real time so there was a good interview with thomas gleixner who's kind of the uh he's the maintainer of the preempt rt patch set so uh he says the infrastructure work never gets the same resources as the latest trendy items so they they can always use more funding uh, so if you're interested in funding this work, contact the Linux Foundation, and there's an RT project there. Uh, people have said, well, what if you once you get the mainlining, aren't you just done? Can't you just walk away? And it's like, no, 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 it's not, it's not that simple. You have to maintain these features, just like you have to maintain any other subsystem. Uh, you'll have to maintain the real-time features so that new kernel code doesn't break the real-time features. And there are currently a bunch of kernel features that are uh, disabled. Uh, they don't work properly under RT. So right now they just disable those features when you turn on preemption. Uh, but uh, they'd like to, of course, they'd like to enable as much of the kernel functionality as possible. So check out this interview by Thomas Gleixner if you're interested in that. Okay, security. Uh, and I'm going to not, uh, I read through this one, inline encryption for file systems. There's, there's three topics. I'm going to cover them really briefly. Uh, so this allows the kernel to offload encryption and decryption to the storage device. I talked about that last time, so I'm going to kind of skip it. A new thing is uh, called control flow integrity. This was mainlined in the 5.13 kernel. And this is a mechanism that allows for, uh, at runtime, uh, the kernel will check that an indirect call goes to a uh, function with the signature that was expected. So one of the one of the most common ways the kernel is attacked is they somehow find a way to alter the, the address of, uh, of a call, uh, a function call. Uh, and the kernel does all kinds of indirect function calls. There's literally thousands. Uh, most of, there's a whole bunch of structures in the kernel. The way the kernel deals with uh, polymorphism essentially is by having 
uh, these structures that have function pointers in them. And so it's relatively, well, uh, one of the things that um, attackers do is they change these function pointers and, and then you go to the wrong place and then all, all kinds of crazy stuff happens. Uh, people get control of your machine or your virtual machine. Uh, so this is, this is a new feature called Forward Edge CFI. Uh, and what, what happens is CFI will actually check the function pointer before it jumps to it, and it compares it with some code that's been put into a jump table. Uh, so this requires clang and link time optimization. This is only supported by LLVM right now, so that is actually really interesting. So this is not a feature that's supported by GCC. Uh, all the indirect call targets are analyzed at compile time and put into jump tables, and loadable modules are kind of handled separately. So you actually at compile time have a list of the legal targets for your for your jump instructions or your call instructions. And then a check is made at execution time that the the pointer you're jumping through is correct. The claim is that this incurs less than 1% overhead. It would actually close the door on a huge number of exploits. Um, and so it's very interesting uh, from a security standpoint. The other security thing that happened in 5.13 is a new security module called the Landlocked Security Module. Uh, and this is um, this allows a process to be converted into a secure mode. So there's a lot of different mechanisms in Linux to kind of containerize processes and prevent them from, from uh, performing operations. There's the original Unix file permissions, uh, but there's also things like AppArmor or uh, SE Linux. Uh, or Tomoyo that that um, that add an additional level of access control rules. Uh, this is a very very simple module. Oh well, the difference between between those systems and this is that this is specifically intended to allow unprivileged users to create secure environments. Most most of the time, all those rule sets are managed by uh, sysadmins and root, and uh, it's really not for the the regular user to do to kind of constrain their environment. So this uh, process, allow, landlock security module, allows you to attach a rule set to a process. Um, and the thing about this is accepting a new security module is, is a pretty big deal. Uh, I th The last time one was accepted was maybe uh, eight or nine years ago. Uh, maybe, I don't know if it was Smack or, at, or Tomoyo, anyway. But so there are not very many Linux security modules, maybe only eight or nine in the kernel. This one took over five years and 74 revisions to get accepted. So that's that's kind of a big deal. If you want to see an example of this, there's actually code in the kernel. That you can go run a little, uh, it's a very, very small program that shows you how to use the thing. You can basically uh, set an environment variable with a list of allowed directories, uh, start the program uh, with the sandbox or app, and then the program is actually constrained within, within that environment. So uh, very simple to use. Uh, and again, the main thing is it can be used by unprivileged users. Uh, let's see, testing. Uh, I am running low on time, so I'm gonna go past this because I, I, uh, I got a lot of stuff to get through. So let's, uh, there's a whole bunch of bugs that haven't been fixed. It's really terrible, <laughs> okay? There's a new testing framework by Huawei uh, that was talked about. Uh, and this is basically Huawei's version of zero day. And the reason it's Huawei's version of Zero Day is because it was created by a developer named uh, Feng Guang Wu, who was, uh, he actually was the one who created Zero Day. And he took all of his uh, information and expertise, and he's now working for Huawei and has developed this framework for them. So very interesting stuff if you're interested in automated test frameworks. Uh, tool chains, uh, you can build the Enfold embedded Linux system with Clang and LLVM 10.0. I talked about that last time. The new news here is that uh, LLVM 12.0 has been released and GCC 11 have been released. And surprisingly, they have uh, some similar features. So there's actually kind of um, a competition going on between these two uh, groups, which is which is good. So uh, some of the one of the things I didn't list here for GCC 11 is they've also got uh, improvements to their diagnostics and. Uh, uh, and LLVM 12.0 has improvements to their link time optimization. So they're they're covering the same types of things. Okay, conferences. Um, so ELC Europe was virtual last year, and so was Open Source Summit Japan. Uh, and this year, we have high hopes 
Well, we had high hopes that we would be able to have uh, in-person conferences. So first we had planned Embedded Linux Conference North America in August and Vancouver, but we decided that was too aggressive. Um, and then we were going to plan for Embedded Linux Conference uh, Europe in Dublin, Ireland, uh, but that has since been changed to uh, Seattle, Washington. And that was based on feedback we got on some forums. There's still a lot of international uh, travelers uh, in Asia and Europe that are not quite ready to uh, travel. And uh, and so uh, we're having, uh, having in the US things are doing a little bit better. Uh, so we have ELC Europe and actually uh, Wade Hassan already talked about this. We've got the CFP that's open right now. Uh, it closes on June 13th. So you've got a couple of weeks to propose a session. You don't have to travel. This will be a hybrid event. So in person and virtual for both attendees and speakers. Uh, the only bummer is uh, for people in Asia, this time zone will be the Pacific time zone. So it's going to be based in Seattle. I didn't know if they were going to move the time zone, but they said they're kind of basically going to do it in Pacific time. So it'll be a little bit late for Europe and Africa, and it'll be terribly inconvenient, probably early in the morning for Asia when all this stuff is going on. Um, COVID issues. We were hoping that we would be able to have in-person events. The situation is changing very rapidly in the US. Uh, it's been really interesting to see as people have gotten vaccinated. Uh, there's a lot of venues, stores and places where uh, that do not require masks anymore. And there's kind of less social distancing. In fact, in outdoor areas, uh, I went to a little league game uh, and uh, there was basically if you're outside, it's fairly rare to see a mask. But I know that's not the case in other places, other places are uh, uh, there's still a lot of uh, restrictions. And so people, there's a wide variety of whether people will be traveling. So we're going to be having hybrid events for the foreseeable future. Uh, when we do on-site events, uh, we'll have, uh, we're trying to have really good support for virtual access as well. So people who either don't want to come or can't come, uh, we, we'll do a lot of stuff to make sure that uh, things are very safe. Uh, we'll reduce the attendance and the the, you know, the we'll have a lot of social distancing. There'll be masks and extra cleaning, and there'll be changes to the format of some events. Um, uh, Tux turns 30 this year, and so that's kind of an exciting event. We'll see what we do in September with that. Okay, industry news. I have a couple of things. I know I'm. Uh, I know you have a little bit of extra schedule and extra time in the schedule, but still have some more news here. So I'll go through the trade association. Okay. Google. Okay. For Yes. You need you need you need not rush, and we okay. have plenty of time. Okay. Okay. Well, good because a couple of these I want to talk about. Uh, so let's talk about. Uh, this is my last major section, but I've got three subsections: trade associations. I'll talk about the Linux Foundation, what they've got going on, Google versus Oracle, and uh, interesting cases of embedded Linux. Actually, one interesting case that's uh, really newsworthy. OK, so Linux Foundation, I, I said this last time, but uh, Linux Foundation is actually doing really, really well. Uh, our financials have, are very, very good. So we did um, we did, you know, because of the shift to virtual events, our event uh, event revenue uh, was down, but our training and mentorship revenue has has really ramped up. Uh, so we have had over two million training and exams delivered. We've got new COBOL training. I know that's kind of a strange one, but there's uh, we're getting more than one new member company added per day, uh, and so and then we've got a whole bunch of these new tools for managing projects that we just rolled out. We spent a whole bunch of money and development effort on tools for managing Linux Foundation projects so that we could scale the organization up, and we have projects literally being announced like every week, and I'm, I'm going to talk about a couple of those. Well, this is this is kind of shows you the scope of activity uh, of the Linux Foundation. It's just unbelievable scope. 208,000 developers contributing to uh, Linux Foundation projects. Um, and you know, millions of, of chat messages, millions of email messages, millions of commit, commits um, are being done every week. Uh, and so, that's their Linux Foundation is is very healthy and and doing a lot of good stuff. So here's some of the stuff that Linux Foundation has been doing recently. So uh, we set up 
a couple of foundations and a new a new actual initiative. So Linux Foundation Research is a new initiative that will actually have a research organization that is part of Linux Foundation right at the top level, kind of the core Linux Foundation. And this is a new initiative to measure, analyze, and describe the impact of open source collaborations. So we'll be using data from uh, Linux Foundation project and tools, so the LFX tools uh, that I showed just now. Um, we'll also get data from other sources, but we'll be preparing reports that we'll give out to the industry uh, to show you know, how open source works, uh, what are the best practices, how the effect of you know, different policies, uh, maybe on like what how does the CLA, how does that affect your contribution rate? Uh, how how do comp what's the best way for companies to get involved with things and what's what's like the ROI on some of this stuff, return on investment. So we've already hired someone named Hillary Carter. And she's gonna be a new Linux Foundation vice president. She did a bunch of this type of work for blockchain doing research and reports. We're also going to establish a research advisory board. So that'll be a group of uh, people, it'll be a committee that will influence the research program and the agenda. So this will actually be a rotating committee. So we'll, we'll invite community leaders and subject matter experts to be on this advisory board to help us uh, figure out what things we should research and what reports we should deliver. So in the future, uh, I don't know when the first reports will be coming out, but I would expect by the end of the year, I'm just making that up. I, I haven't heard a, a date for that, but I think things are well underway. Uh, we've actually hired, hired people. And so, so I think that's gonna be really good. Um, another, another one. So Linux Foundation has lots, lots of kind of sub projects and foundations it creates. And the, there were two that I thought were interesting. One is the AgStack Foundation, and this is a project to create open source repositories of tools, models, data, and source code uh, for the agriculture or farming sector. So there's a bunch of standards that exist. Uh, and there's public data that's avail available, but uh, it's not been uh, kind of collected all into one place and um, and then kind of integrated with specific open source projects. So there's things like Hyperledger, Kubernetes, Open Horizon, Postgres. There's all these projects uh, that need to kind of be applied to this data and these standards. And so the goal, overall goal, is to kind of bring the supply chain for agriculture uh, into the 21st century to to help them be you know create a digital supply chain. The the overall goal ultimately is to increase productivity and reduce waste. It's shocking uh, to me. One of the stats they had in their in their announcement was that 33 percent of all produ food produced worldwide is currently wasted uh, because of inefficiencies in the supply chain and distribution networks and things like that. And so you could feed a lot of people. I mean, currently, I think they said 9% uh, of the world uh, goes hungry. Um, and uh, we have more than enough food in the world to, to take care of uh, the population if we manage it better. So uh, increased collaboration can help with interoperation and improve efficiency uh, throughout the supply chain. And uh, we could do a lot of good in the world by kind of modernizing the agricultural stacks. Uh, that we have. So, and then another initiative uh, is a completely separate initiative called Green Software. So, I thought this was kind of ironic that, you know, agriculture and green, but this is actually about uh, doing standards, uh, not just in the agricultural area, but uh, standards, toolings, and best practices to reduce the use, uh, reduce power usage for software, just software in general. So it's actually focused a little bit on data centers. Data centers now account for about 1% of global electricity demand, uh, but that's actually forecasted to rise. Uh, so to three to 8%. So if you can make a, if you can like decrease the amount of uh, energy that's, that software uses uh, through efficiency <clears throat> and uh, other, other mechanisms, uh, you know, changing abstractions, things like that, uh, that could make a big impact uh, and it could, the basic idea is we want to limit, limit the carbon footprint of data centers and other computer related activities. So if you could improve the efficiency of uh, compute devices everywhere throughout the world, uh, that would be a big thing. Uh, so those are, I mean, the Linux Foundation uh, does not take on small things. They take on fairly big uh, 
uh, kind of society changing projects. You know, last month I talked about the, the Global Health Initiative. Uh, these are big projects uh, that, that tackle a lot of the most pressing problems in society. Uh, OK, I, I have to talk about Google v Oracle. So this is a case that this was a, a lawsuit. Oracle sued Google uh, because uh, Google had used the Java API in Android. So, but this case was decided on April fifth. Uh, I think it. I think the uh, the actual arguments uh, were done in November. So it takes the Supreme Court a long time to write up their results, <clears throat> make their decisions. But basically, this case had been going on through the courts for many years. I think at least five or six years, maybe ten. Um, but Oracle asserted that Google couldn't use the Java API in Android. That this was a copyright violation. Um, and you know, Java owned or Oracle owned the Java implementation, and they felt like they owned the Java API, and they didn't think it was good that Google used the Java API without their permission. Uh, but the interesting thing is, jo Google did not use Oracle's Java implementation. They didn't use the the code that performs the actual functions. They used the API definition, so they used the Java method call signatures. So in, in C terms, uh, this is the equivalent of the header files. Uh, so how the APIs are defined, but none of the code that actually implements it. And the groundbreaking ruling in the US, and I don't know how much it'll apply throughout the world, but the groundbreaking ruling in the US was that the Supreme Court ruled that Google's use was fair use under US copyright law. So fair use means that there are uh, copyright law says there are certain things that people are prohibited from doing with other people's intellectual property. Uh, but fair use says even if it's copyrighted, there are things that are allowed. And and the Supreme Court basically said, well, this is allowed. You can do that. The, or at least in this particular case, the way Google did it was fair use. So the Supreme Court did not rule. A bunch of people were hoping that the Supreme Court would rule on that APIs were not copyrightable. Uh, so that it was, you didn't even have to apply U.S. copyright law. The, the copyright didn't apply at all. But that was kind of too much, uh, or outside the scope. The Supreme Court did not rule on that. They did not say it was or was not copyrightable. So they did not actually make that decision or that, you know, uh, precedent. Uh, this, but so, but the the net effect is that uh, it, you can use APIs. And in particular, this is a really, really big deal for open source software. So open source software relies on the ability of people to use APIs and write compatible libraries and compatible frameworks. Uh, most of the software industry <coughs> wanted APIs to be usable in an open way. So a lot of, a lot of other companies like Microsoft and Facebook uh, agreed with the decision and had, had written briefs to support Google's position. Uh, but anyway, this was this was really good news. Uh, well, it was good news if you were if you agreed with with Google's uh, philosophy, or, or that APIs should be fair use. Um, let's see. Okay, and then I got to talk about the Mars helicopter. So last time when I when I talked about the Mars helicopter, which is the Ingenuity helicopter, last time I had a uh, an artist rendering of of the Mars helicopter. This is a picture of it sitting on Mars. So uh, as in March, it had not been deployed yet. It was still sitting underneath the rover. Uh, but uh, the so what is the Mars helicopter? The Mars Ingenuity helicopter landed in February on Mars, and it performed a series of tests and demonstrations in April. So this was really a test of commercial off-the-shelf software and hardware in space. So the rover, the Perseverance rover that the U.S. has running around on Mars, uses a, a specialized rad-hardened, rad radiation-hardened processor that costs about $250,000 for one processor and runs at 200 megahertz running VxWorks. So uh, you compare that with the helicopter, which is this, okay, so that's running this car-sized thing. Um, and it's very, very expensive to develop. Um, the Qualc uh, the helicopter has a Qualcomm Snapdragon processor running at 2.6 gigahertz with a Linux OS. So they took an off-the-shelf processor, uh, they took an open source 
uh, software operating system. And obviously it's running like, what, 10 times faster. Um, and it's the same processor that's used in, in mobile phones from about the era when they started the project, 2014, 2015. So it's a six year old project, but, um, and a bunch of the components, a bunch of the hardware components were actually off the shelf. So the, the cost of goods of this helicopter were actually very, very low. So the total development cost was high because this is still a one-off, very specialized project. So you have a lot of people uh, and there's operations costs, communicate with Mars and, and very special software development. But this was a demonstration that you could use off the shelf hardware and space hardware. So the results, it worked. I don't know if you can see this animation, if it's animating for you, but there, there should be a little, a little helicopter taking off. Um, so it performed five flights in April each with increasing difficulty. So they took, they started very slowly. The first flight just went up and hovered and came down. Uh, the last flight was actually uh, pretty aggressive. They took a one-way trip. So all the other flights, flights one through four, one through four, they took off, flew, flew kind of a ways away, uh, took some pictures, and then flew back and landed in the same place. And so since they were landing in the same place, they had a pretty good idea you know, they knew what the obstacles were, what the rocks were. Um, the last flight was a one-way trip. And they had scouted the location, but uh, but it was pretty dicey to go someplace and land in a new in a new place. Um, so the hardware. So uh, the hardware has two 1.2 meter counter rotating blades. They're very fast. Uh, they spin very fast because the Martian atmosphere is not very dense. It's got a 13 megapixel camera uh, for for video and and uh, high res images they've got a 0.5 megapixel camera for terrain mapping and navigation they got a bunch of uh sensors the altimeter and the inertial and a bunch of those sensors they are some of those they ordered off of spark fun uh which is a you know a, a hobbyist computer hardware site uh, but they had batteries solar panels carbon tube landing legs one of the things i found out since i gave this presentation in march was that uh I, I was curious, how did they deal with the with you know the Martian cold? And uh, uh, it was actually very simple. They they the body of the helicopter is insulated, and they heated it so that the electronic electronics could withstand the cold temperatures. So I mean, you know, that's an obvious solution, but I wasn't exactly sure. the the um, The other way the rover deals with that is it's also heated, but it has backup in that it. Uh, it's radiation hard processor. You know, it can it can actually withstand kind of very very extreme environments. In terms of the open source software, uh, it's running Linux version 3.4, so a relatively recent version of the Linux kernel. I mean, well, it's like old by we're in the five series now, but when they picked the software, you know, it was this pretty modern, uh, pretty modern version of the kernel, and it's not that far removed from from what's available and still in some phones. Uh, it uses uh, open source flight software that NASA developed called F Prime, and you can actually go out and and download this flight control software and use it in your own projects. And actually, making that software open source was uh, was a pretty big deal. And this this was really interesting. There's uh, they made a list. GitHub went out and made a list of all of the software that was used on the helicopter uh, that uh, came from GitHub, and uh, if you have, and so I, I recommend going out and looking at that list. There's about, uh, I think, 20 or 30 different projects. But if you have a commit in one of those projects, uh, you can actually get a contributor badge for your GitHub account. So you can have like a little badge on your GitHub account. If you contributed to any of the projects, including the Linux kernel uh, that is used in the in the helicopter, uh, you can get this you know little little badge logo that shows that you were a contributor. Unfortunately. My GitHub account uses my personal email address, and and I have a I have a bunch of contributions to the Linux kernel that are actually in that version, that 3.4 version of the kernel, but they're on my Sony account, and so my email my Sony email address is not is is not the same one as for my my personal GitHub account, so I did not get a bad, but I, but I still feel pretty good. My software is up there. Uh, a couple of the patches that I wrote are up there on Mars doing their thing in the helicopter. Um. So in terms of the helicopter software, 
Uh, just a little bit of extra data here. The guidance loops are running at 500 mega, 500 hertz, not megahertz, 500 hertz. So every 500 times a second or every two milliseconds, they're they're uh, checking the status of their control loops. Uh, they're doing uh, frame tracking at 30 hertz, uh, feature tracking. So the helicopter actually does a pre-programmed flight with uh, some degree of autonomy. Uh, you can't control it real time from Earth because of the delay, speed of light delay. Uh, and in fact, it takes them a whole day before they, they get kind of the data back from uh, the rover. So the launch is actually blind uh, for the first meter. Uh, so they, they actually do not use the camera or the altimeter until they think they're one meter off the ground. And that's because they weren't sure how much dust they'd be kicking up and, and whether it would confuse the camera or the altimeter. Um, so they actually are just using inertial sensors and, until they get one meter off the ground. And then they turn everything on and have their full uh, flight uh, uh, control and navigation. So there's no GPS on Mars. They, they don't have a global positioning setting. They don't have satellites for that, doing that for Mars, because there's no there's nothing on Mars but a couple of rovers and this helicopter. Um, so it has to use its own sensors to estimate position. So uh, it doesn't like autonomously select targets. It's not that kind of that smart, but uh, they send it a list of uh, pre-programmed flight data saying how high to go uh, and <clears throat> and you know what direction to travel and how to orient itself and what, what things to take pictures of. Uh, but it does have some autonomy. So it uses OpenCV and pattern matching. So it actually it takes images of the ground and establishes its position and its orientation. And it can use that to refine the landing site and land right back where it, where it started from. The interesting thing is that things are going to change now. So, uh, well, and I'll talk about that in a second, but there were some bugs. <laughs> so it's a, bu it's a bummer when you have software bugs on your helicopter on Mars. Uh, they experienced some problems during their first uh, blade spin-up test, and also their first attempt of Flight 4 did not work. Uh, they uh, ha they said the only thing they said they didn't give a whole lot of detail. They said there was a watchdog timer expiration. So we all know what a watchdog timer is. That means something took too long, and uh, the the there was a timer that said, okay, I don't know what's going on, but it's taking longer than expected, so we'll shut down. And so there's some kind of unexpected delay transitioning between uh, the operating modes, and uh, NASA. Uh, decided that they could mitigate the issue. They didn't completely eliminate it, but they mitigated it by altering kind of the instruction sequence. Or I, I'm sure they have ways to put delays in their the instructions they send for you know a particular flight. So they originally thought they would have to upload new firmware, uh, which would be kind of scary uh, to actually re you know to do a in field update of the flight software, the operating system. Uh, but they so they actually made the changes. They had the changes on the ground that they thought about doing. But they said, well, it's uh, it's a little bit too dicey. They estimate uh, because of this watchdog timer bug that they have that each, each flight has about a 15 percent chance of failure. And so that's what happened on flight four. <coughs> so even though they kind of redid the the instruction sequence, they had a 15 percent chance of failure and they happened to hit it on on flight four. Uh, but they just you know, said, well, try it again the next day, and it worked fine the next day. So they can still upload new firmware if they need to, and it's already been written. Uh, but I don't think they're going to. The number of missions they have left is very, very, is kind of anticipated to be small. They they fulfilled all their objectives, and so anything they do from here, they, I think they can handle a 15% failure rate. Um, and other than that, all the software has performed as intended. So the, the first missions were had a 30-day budget. So what's happening is the rover is kind of sitting there, and, and while they were doing these tests with the helicopter, the rover was filming it and recording it, audio of it, and uh, you know trying to you know make observations of the helicopter itself. Now the rover has to go do its its thing on Mars. It has to do its own science. So the rover, the helicopter doesn't have a lot of science on it. It was just a demo that this stuff could be done at all with uh, off-the-shelf hardware in Linux, um, and to test hardware and software capabilities for that type of hardware, uh, off-the-shelf stuff in uh, the environment of another planet. So you have very thin atmosphere, cold temperatures, less sun, less gravity, um, and the mission was a complete success. 
So, uh, I mean, they did have a bug, but they accomplished all five flights that they had intended. They gathered performance data, audio pictures. So it was it was a great deal. And this is some of the some of the information from it. So there's a picture of the on the right there of the fourth flight, the helicopter in the air. Uh, these these other two pictures, or sorry, on the the left, on the right, these other two pictures show kind of where uh, where they scattered out the location. Uh, and the middle picture shows the the uh, the third flight, uh, second and third flights went north uh, in kind of that little zone, uh, the ellipse there. And then the south flight, or no, the fourth, the second and third flights did that. The fourth flight went to the south and scouted out a new location. And then the fifth flight took off from uh, its original landing zone, which they called Wright, Wright Brothers Field, and flew down and landed at a new location. So it was the first time it was a one-way flight. All the others had been uh, go out and come back. So on the other picture on the far right shows uh, where the rover was uh, during this stuff. So the rover uh, landed on the planet and then went over to a location where it dropped the helicopter off uh, and and then moved out of the way and went up to like a little hill where it could watch what was going on as the rover did its flights. So now the rover is, or now the, the rover's off doing its science missions. It's you know looking at rocks and analyzing soil samples and, and doing those things, taking taking lots of really interesting pictures. So it's doing its science mission. Uh, and the helicopter uh, has now flown to someplace else. And uh, I'll kind of explain the reason for that. So the they granted the helicopter permission to continue doing its mission in what they call an operations demonstration. So as they find time available, so when they have kind of spare time for the rover to, to you know, relay the instructions to the helicopter, they're going to continue to do one-way flights to new locations. Um, so they have to fly to keep in range of the rover. They can't just go flying, you know, like, you know, kilometers away because the, the, uh, helicopter uses can't doesn't communicate directly with earth or the mars satellites it it can only relay information through the rover so they have to keep within a certain distance of the rover um and so what they're doing is they're kind of predicting where the rover is going to go because they the perseverance team the rover team knows where they're going to move the rover to and so they will actually fly to where the where the rover is going to be in two to three weeks and so the next couple missions they'll provide aerial photography of features of interest um, and so they can give they can give kind of detailed pictures uh, before the rover even gets to an area, and they expect to fly about every two to three weeks, and uh, they're going to continue that until August. And I've heard that in August uh, Mars goes into Martian winter or something, and and then uh, it's all over for the helicopter. It says it's a solar powered helicopter, and I think they may not have enough um, sun to keep it alive through a Martian winter. Um, but they already have flight six is already planned. Uh, they're going to plan to fly south, even farther south from where they are now, uh, take some photos of a previously unexplored area. And then this is the interesting thing. They're going to land in an unscouted location. So they're, they've seen the area from satellite, but they have no idea. I mean, so the ground conditions look good, but they're actually going to go have the helicopter land in an area that it's not taken a picture of previously and has not... Uh, has not scouted. So that's going to be really interesting. So they're sending it into unknown territory. Uh, so it's very exciting. So this is, I think, possibly one of the most exciting uses of embedded Linux that I can recall in a long time. You know, there, there's all kinds of really exciting, you know, don't get me wrong. I, I like to see Linux and, you know, TV sets and cameras. And that's kind of, kind of my job at Sony. But, uh, but this is really cool to see it operating on another planet. Um, so there's a bunch of sources uh, for the Mars helicopter stuff. Okay, just uh, last thing here is I just want to talk about the resources I used for this talk. I use a whole lot of LWN.net, and you can tell that from uh, a lot of the links. I also read Foronix. Uh, they have a, a lot of good information. And then the eLinux Wiki and, and Google, and then just I notice stuff in the news as I, as I read along. Um, so with that, uh, I will say thank you for your time. Uh, sorry, I went a little bit over, but I yeah, I saw that you had a little bit of cushion in your time, and I hope this has been useful information for you. So, uh, and I'm happy to take uh, questions or 
uh, comments at this time. Thank you very much. Thank you, Tim. And you will be able to find some of the comments in, in the in the chat. Oh, okay. And what chat is saying that uh, one of the uh, interesting thing that uh, it's something amazing that uh, Linux is running up on the eight meg meg megabyte, you know, memory size. Is it something reality or something? Now that kind of you know uh, comment was there. Yeah, I well, I don't know. <laughs> I. Yes, you can. Well, you could. Uh, I mean, I used to run Linux. I think the smallest system I ever ran Linux on was uh, 2.5 megabytes. Wow, that's but, too small. <laughs> but that was a long time ago. That that was literally like over 10 years ago. Uh, and uh, so that was probably Linux 2.4. Maybe. Uh, and so, so... You know, I know it's gotten bigger since then, but I think I think that there. I mean, yeah, I haven't seen a lot of size, um, uh, a lot of size presentations at uh, embedded Linux conference recently. Uh, but there were still people who were working on putting on Linux on microcontrollers who were down in the two to three meg range. So I think eight meg is actually not too bad. I think it's possible. Um, it, when, when you go down to it, it's really, really hard to get it down to that size. I mean, it takes months and months of work and a lot of trimming and, and specializing stuff. And you have to you have to rip out a whole bunch of stuff that's barely Linux when you're done, when you're getting it down to like two or three meg. But I think in eight meg, I, you know, well, I don't know. You still have to do a lot of trimming. And I don't think there's much left over for user space. So I don't know what people are doing with this Nintendo 64 port, but uh, it's interesting. Okay. Another one is that uh, just an, uh, uh, you know, uh, supplementary information from me. That is about uh, Google versus Oracle. That is the, uh, you, you mentioned about the fair use. Uh, that's uh, uh, some of the thing, which is limited to uh, US copyright law. And uh, that's kind of, you know, uh, uh, thing. Uh, fair use is not uh, defined within the Japanese the Japanese copyright law, law or some of, many of the European copyright law. But uh, maybe it must be a quite, you know, inf a quite, you know, good, you know, indication to global, you know, judgment of the, uh, uh, that kind of my understanding about API. And also as an engineer, we have to be reminded that copyright law is something quite, you know, uh, engineers unfriendly uh, copy uh, law that is uh, that have a very very huge you know vague viewpoint that is uh, yes uh, they have a bunch of things which we cannot say yes or no so that uh, you'd better make a sign with good communication with the legal people if you can and also you you should learn something about uh, you know fundamental of the copyright rule other than the software engineers. That's my suggestions. Yeah. Yeah, I I had hoped, like many others, that the Supreme Court would rule that APIs were not copyrightable. Uh, that would have been a much stronger reaction. Um, but I was pretty pleased. I, I was pleased enough <laughs> with yeah. the result that they came out with. One of the things that was interesting was that the judges actually showed a good understanding of the difference mm -hmm. between an API and an implementation. And and uh, one of the judge who wrote the decision actually talked about the difference between implementation code and interface code. Uh, and that was actually really good because, uh, you know, you never know if judges are going to kind of understand the technical details. Mm -hmm. There were, uh, I will be honest, there were a couple of things I think they got wrong. Uh, in the overall, I mean, in terms of their analysis, there were some technical things that I don't think they understood uh, as well, but they did get that right. And that was yeah. actually really good to set a precedent. Yeah, I think so. And also, uh, we had in Japan, an, uh, you know, uh, presentation, some of the explanation by the software, that is software information center, which is uh, some of the enforcer of the uh, software, software from the legal viewpoint. 
that software's information center made a presentation about a tutorial. What happened about uh, that kind of Supreme uh, Court decision about uh, Google versus Oracle? And during that uh, presentation, I have I I had one impression that uh, uh, for many of the uh, you know attorneys, it's something quite difficult to understand some of the fundamentals of the software software thing software of things. That is, uh, for example, they have quite hardly to understand what what API means or what link means or what that kind of things. So that uh, I am now recently thinking that uh, it's something quite important to be kind enough to the attorneys or legal people to support their and to them to understand the software technologies or some of the uh, that kind of term terminologies. And uh, that's what I'm uh, I'm recently thinking about it. And some of the person attending this, you know, jamboree is all, also starting to collaborate co collaborate with uh, that kind of thing. And I feel uh, great, you know, thanks to those kind of people. Yeah, yeah, it's it would it's a good thing to uh, educate people about kind of the the nuances, the differences. Right. I mean, some of, you know, interface versus implementation and that. Yeah. Okay. And also another thing is that uh, I just have an idea to hold some of the extra jamboree just after the ELC because ELC will be held at the timing of the uh, timing uh, time zone, which is quite you know, inconvenient for many of the Asian people. So yeah. that set up the another you know uh, jamboree just after ELC. That is the uh, both American people and both uh, both American people and Asian people to be uh, you know acceptable. That is uh, morning time in Japan and evening time yeah. for the it's for the United States to have uh, some of the uh, the frame of the uh, uh, you know some of the uh, ELC topics and speech yeah. for those kind of people who are using this, you know, teams or, uh, you know, remote style. And I'd like to make a, a proposal to you guys and maybe we'd like to set up some of the extra jamboree, uh, which is for the Asian people at the timing of the early October or that kind of that time zone. And I hope you to make uh, some of the help. Yeah, I think that'd be a good time. OK, another question or some of the comment or some of the uh, something to talk. Hello, can I can I have a question? Of course, why not? Yeah. Hi, Kim Sam. Hi. This is Tanaka speaking. So regarding the University of Minnesota, Minnesota issue, so it, will the kernel community uh, reconsider current uh, submission process by that, that problem, by that issue? Um, <clears throat> probably not a lot. Mm -hmm. <laughs> it brought attention to the fact, well, it brought attention to the fact that yes, you can get uh, malicious code into the kernel, um, mm. but, and, you know, and the, the review process is not perfect, but we kind of already knew that. I mean, mm -hmm. The, the the maintainers are kind of overworked. The maintainers mm. do use uh, a kind of a model of trust. Mm. So when they see patches from someone who they've never seen before, uh, then they actually do give them extra scrutiny. And that actually worked pretty well. Mm. So the patches that were submitted by University of Minnesota, uh, they were recognized as kind of not great patches. Mm. Uh, and and they were given extra scrutiny and in case in, in well one of the so one of the fake accounts that they made was had the name James Bond, which <laughs> which people figured out pretty quickly that that was not a real name, and uh, and so actually so parts of the process worked really well and, and at least one developer Chris, Christoph Helwig <laughs> had a completely different reaction than most people, he, he mm. said. Uh, these guys ought, got a, ought to receive a medal for exposing how bad our review process is. <laughs> <laughs> so 
he was saying we know we all know that you know there are holes in our review process and it's good to shine a light on it and so he was he was saying that you know we could we should learn from this mm -hmm. uh but uh, I think most most engineers said, well, we did a pretty good job. We did a, a better job than a lot of other communities would have done at detecting these patches and keeping them out of the kernel. Uh, so I, I, I think that there will be a lot of discussions in mm. like at the next at the next um, like plumbers conference or, or kernel summit. Uh, there'll be a lot of discussions about that. And if there are, are ways we can we can change. But right now, I haven't seen a lot of people talking about changing much, which mm -hmm. is a little disappointing because there it is a problem. Mm. So anyway. OK, thank you. Yeah. Yeah, but current, I, I think current, yeah, current contributors effort is very uh, high. So I, and so I hope uh, uh, to if that process will be changed also, those person's effort can be reduced. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, and and I think the automated testing is helping a lot. So mm. a lot. Of, one of the one of the things that really got overlooked uh, is the paper did the paper consisted of multiple parts, mm. uh, and one of the parts had to do with these uh, you know vulnerabilities, these bugs they tried to introduce. Uh, but there, another part of the paper talked about how they found those vulnerabilities and how to identify them, and I think that actually was very very valuable. And so. One of the things that University of Minnesota was doing was they said, well, these are the types of bug, these are the types of bugs that we think would go undetected. And we're going to try and write an automated test system to try and detect them. Mm. And so I, that, I, there were there were positive aspects of their research. And unfortunately, it kind of got lost in the noise. Uh, and so but I think it'll I think it'll be good going forward. Mm. Uh, so I think things will improve because of the whole episode, which is kind of kind of interesting given that there was so much kind of outrage about it. Hmm. Okay, thank you. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, is anybody have any question or some of the uh, you know uh, comment? Thank you, Kim. So as always, uh, it's very informative stuff, and I'm a bit uh, surprised. Uh, Community guys, including you, are very conscious and uh, sharp about uh, this Minnesota thing. So, because uh, <laughs> these guys are not the only for the technical focus, the social things are very, very important for the community work. So, yeah. I learned a lot. Thank you very much. <laughs> That's hey, a well. quite eth ethical issue, and yeah. uh, we have to be, ca be careful. Yeah. Yeah. One thing I was really impressed that uh, I, I, until I read the, um, until I read the paper, the uh, report by the tab, uh, I didn't. I didn't know some of the other background. But the fact that it had been identified as an ethics issue way back in November, you know, the paper had been submitted to a conference, and and there was actually a letter signed by several other researchers saying, "Hey, there are some ethics problems with this." With this, so mm -hmm. I thought that was really really good. So I mean, it wasn't just. Um, it wasn't just the kernel people who figured this out. There were, I mean, there were people in the industry uh, at, at IEEE and other places that that saw the problems with their methods and and, and tried to um, object to them. I mean, so that I I think it's very very like they ended up withdrawing the paper voluntarily from the IEEE, but I think the IEEE was going to. Uh, after, especially after the ban, I think the IEEE was probably going to reject the paper uh, after they after they identified, you know, the ethics issues. So, mm -hmm. but I, I was impressed with people outside the community saw the ethics issues before yeah. we did. So that was good. We Which is think that kind of things a lot. <laughs> yeah. <clears throat> Uh, Minakasan, thank you very much. And Minakasan, uh, I think uh, we'd, we'd better to have uh, some of the communication that is uh, to hold some of the repeat session of the ERC just mm -hmm. after the you know ERC to be held. I I am a bit you know concerned about uh, some of the uh, you know uh, uh, arrangement will be required in uh, in conjunction with the Linux Foundation. We would not like to make uh, some of the 
uh, obstacle to make the ESC to be benefit to be some of the beneficial. Uh, but uh, we like to make uh, some of the, you know, uh, 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 some of the another, you know, uh, a value add for the ALC to, mm -hmm. during that kind of you know, repeat session. Yeah, let's do that. Yeah, I don't know the, what uh, they're planning for the ELC Japan things, but uh, I think that they may have the no outstanding issues there. So okay. Let's do Good. So anyway, uh, we'd like to uh, finish this session. And uh, uh, again, is there is, is there anybody to would like to make some of this, uh, you know, comment or question? Okay. Anyway, thank you very much, team, and uh, have a great great day. Yep. Have have a good lunch. Yes. <laughs> thank you. Thank you. Uh, and have a good dinner. <laughs> okay. Bye. See you then. Bye. So, uh,